Chapter 3 The Creation of Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden In the second chapter of Genesis, we have an account of the creation of Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden, which is an allegory on human life with Irish names and idioms. It is so manifestly of Irish origin that it needs only to have attention called to the fact for anyone who is at all versed in Irish folklore or tradition and acquainted with the Irish habit of using metaphor in storytelling, as even at the present day to recognise it. No doubt the clerical scribes who translated and revised the ancient Irish felt satisfied that, with the Irish language and culture suppressed and destroyed, no one in a future age would be able to discover the deception which was perpetrated in telling the Christian world that the scriptures were obtained from, from a tribe of so-called Hebrew people who lived in a desert and mountainous country in Asia, now called Syria. But, as fate would have it, the deception was not destined to go undiscovered. In the circumstances, it was bound to be discovered, as the plans of those who sought to destroy the Irish language and culture failed in their ultimate purpose, as in much as the Irish language was not completely destroyed, as was intended in order to conceal this great deceit. The forces behind this purpose felt so secure that with, that with the Irish lang language interdicted so that anyone found speaking it was to be punished with death and the Irish people, through severe oppression, reduced to a lower state in number, they thought themselves safe in retaining and the translation of the Irish names and of the characters which they found in the original Irish scriptures. <clears throat> Feeling th thus secure and with the aid of cunning trickery and disguising and distorting words by compounding and misspelling them, they have escaped discovery until now. This discovery awaited only the advent of someone free from superstition broad enough and sufficiently keen to apprehend and penetrate the formidable array of historic fiction which has been issued and circulated to bolster up this great and now most transparent deception. Thus equipped and with these mental qualities present, even a working knowledge of the Irish language was necessary to trace in that most ancient cultural mother tongue, the original idioms and ideas permeating the scriptures and to uncover the astutely shaded and reconstructed names of characters and places preserved in the Bible narratives. From now on, these pages will be replete with evidence of this studious method of deception. In Genesis chapter 11, 7, it reads, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. This is apparently an adherence to and translation from the ancient Irish scripture as the man thus create, created bears an Irish name, Adam. Our churchmen tell us that this name means I am. The name Adam in this form would be a combination of two Irish words to wit, ad, I, and saam, am. This combination with the letter S omitted would form the name Adam. As the revisers have given it in the text, the original form of this name character is Adam, and as the revisers have given it in the text, over the making given oh, the original form of this name character is Adam. The dot over the D making it D, and the dot over the M making it M. Thus, the true and original form of this Irish name character was Adam, which could read Adhama and pronounced A of the letter D being silent and the letters MH being sounded as V. This shows us that the revisers took the frame of the original word and omitted its qualifying features and preserved the mere skeleton of the form. It will also be readily seen that the form Adam is not consistent with the idea embodied in the myth 
as it is but an abbreviated and emasculated form of the name of our first parents, Adam and Eve, as in this form it does not express or symbolize a dual or plural name in one. It is just this idea of a dual or plural name and one that is expressed and embodied in the original form of the name character Adam. This is the name word that was formulated by the inspired masters who wrote our first scriptures and it is compatible with the idea which has been preserved in the translated form of the text that the Lord called their name Adam. This original form of the Irish name word is plural and contains the double name Adam and Eve or father, mother in one. Thus A for father and Av for mother Eve. This harmonizes perfectly with the statement in the text which the revisers beclouded and obscured from the norm form Adam. The text reads, male and female created, he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Genesis 1, 2. The name word Adam, I am, denoted consciousness of being, but insofar as implying spiritual consciousness, it applies only to few, as to the many, it anticipates them by ages. This Irish name character, genitive from its root word ad, had also in its original form, Adam, an additional meaning, whom is compatible with the divine idea, and in harmony with an enlightened conception of God's loving kindness for all his children, and which the revisers deleted in the translation. In this original form, Adam, pronounced ah, of, means joy, gladness, felicity, happiness. So it will be seen that the name character truthfully and faithfully res reflects the conception of the master adepts as to the loving disposition of the creator towards his creation, mankind and also the natural attitude of every pair of rational parents towards the arrival of every young Adam which is born to them. This word is a true Irish etymon. It is not borrowed from another language, nor is, it, is in an exceptional solid, solitary or accidental war in the Irish language. There are other words derived from the same root which are also suggestive of the original significance of the name. Such are the words Adamra, Adhamra, meaning admiration, Atamrad, Atamraid, meaning to bless, love, adore, Adamrak, Adhamrak, meaning blessed, and Adamair. Adamaya, meaning similitude or like, likeness. This is clearly in accordance with the ancient Irish adept postulate that God is love and that he made man in his own image and likeness. Thus the alteration from the original Irish becomes most evident and clear. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 11 slash 8, Adam is placed in the Garden of Eden. In this word Eden, the revisers have also practiced a deceit in the spelling and the consequent disguised form in which they have presented their original Irish word to us in the text. The word Eden is a disguised and distorted one, formed from the original word in the Irish scripture myth. The word is Oiden and pronounced Aden and signifies love, tenderness, generosity. In this definition or explanation of the word Aden in the original scripture, we catch a glimpse of the high and, and true spiritual idea or conception of the creation of man, which was held by the ancient Irish adept masters. Here we have embodied in the Irish original word Aden, a true concept of God's creation of man. It was a work of love, spiritual love, and God placed Adam and Eve in the garden of love, tenderness, generosity, charity, and forbearance. Love which, as man becomes less gross and sensual by abdignation of the flesh, 
suppression of passions and desires, will eventually become greater, broader and be translated to spiritual love. This will lead to spiritual regeneration or birth into the solar or spiritual body. This word Aden alone with its explanation should remove doubt in the mind of any intelligent person as to whence our scripture came originally and who its authors were. The story about the allegorical Garden of Eden where the earth man Adam is placed is the human body at generation and the tree of life Genesis 11 slash 9 which is also the tree of knowledge is the phallic tree or organ of generation which is in the midst of the garden or body. There are two aspects to the allegory of the garden, the spiritual and the physical, and it is this latter aspect whom, whom the revisers had in mind when they formulated the word Eden, for it conforms to this idea very closely in its construction and fails to convey all sense directly in its English form of the Irish root word for which it is substituted. In this aspect, the word Eden means a den or cave, signifying the body. In the myth, Eden was meant for the body, and this can be easily understood by the explanation of the verses of Genesis 2 slash 10 to 14. Verse 10 reads, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became four heads. The name of the first river is Pison. This is an Irish name word, a compound of two syllables, peace, urine, and the second word on, which is an abbreviation of the word thon, meaning the hips or buttocks. The name of the second river is the disguised Irish word thon and is distorted to hihon, also the hips or buttocks. This river is the elementary canal. This river, we are told in Genesis 11.13, is it which com compasses the whole land of Ethiopia, the land of serpent, serpent worship, which means the lower part of the body or buttocks, the sensual region, as this part of the body is the seat of the sex principle. The Ethiopians, therefore, mean those who worship the serpent of sex, those who entertain, entertain thoughts of sex or indulge in sensual practice or pursuits. <clears throat> the name of the third river is Hedekel, that is which goeth to the east of Assyria. This river is the blood, and the reason for its being placed east of Assyria is that Assyria is a cryptic name for the lower section or central region of the body. And as the blood of the body all goes to the heart, which is the organ or seat of a higher principle, and it is said to be in the east. This is because the sun, the center and source of all good, comes from the east. <coughs> this shows us clearly that the revisers took their ideas from the scriptures of the ancient Irish sun worship of Vaiesa. The name of the fourth ri river is Euphrates. This river is the semen. It is a Greek word and means fraternal, brotherly friendship implying love. The 16th and 17th verses read, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat f of it, for in the day that thou eatest there of thou shalt surely die. <coughs> <coughs> These two verses contain the ancient Irish theological idea of inversion, as below, so above, and as above, so below, and generation in the body implies death to the spirit. That is, he who eats of this fruit is himself destined to be reincarnated into another physical body at the expiration of his present life on earth. Sex intercourse brings man back into the physical, bring, brings man back to earth. In the 17th verse is presupposed the violation of the sexual prohibition while Adam and Eve is yet in the spiritual Eden. And the penalty for 
which was death, that is, to be cast out and born into the body of flesh on this lower material plane. For the ancient idea was that birth in the body is death to the spirit. So in this text, it is the archetypal or spiritual Eden that is considered. In the following 18th verse, this may be easily inferred, as it does not imply an angry or unloving disposition of the Lord towards Adam after being cast out. Quite the contrary. The verse reads, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. This verse shows clearly that it was not a physical or bodily death that was meant as a penalty for eating of the fruit of the tree in the midst of the garden, but spiritual death, that is, generation, or in other words, to be born into the physical body. This is very clearly shown by the fact that God created a helpmeet for Adam in order that generation might proceed and the race be perpetuated. This is obvious, as without a help meet for him, there would be no human race. <clears throat> the manner in which the Lord created this help meet and why she was called woman is told in Genesis 11, 21, 22, 23 as follows. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the, the Lord God had taken from man, he made a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. In this version of the creation of woman, the revisers have made a play on the Irish word rib in the original and stressed its meaning having the Lord perform a major surgical operation upon the unconscious Adam and thereby giving it sub rosa, a touch of callous humour. In the Irish, the, root, the word rib means a snare, a siren, and from the ancient Irish ideal priestly viewpoint, indirectly and figuratively, signifies a woman. The word rib is a pure Irish etymon, it can be seen from the words genitive to it. From this Irish root word, we get the words rib, pronounced riv, meaning with you, to you, and also ribe and ribog, meaning a flake, a ribbon, a whisker, a keepsake, a rib of hair, and ribech, meaning a line or long string, a rag. From these meanings of the word rib and its genitive words, he can readily understand how in constructive allegory or figurative language it was used by the ancient Irish adepts to signify a woman. And the meanings given above are objects of endearment to woman, her hair, ribbons for adornment, and a rag signifying clothes, and rib as a snare and a siren as most suggestive of the attractiveness for which woman has for man. The doctors have, in this translation, given to the Irish word rib an extended meaning from a snare or siren and rib of hair, rag and ribbon to rib bone and bone of my bones. So it becomes, a, becomes very easy to understand where the revisers got their idea and model for the creation of the woman. In Genesis 2, 23, they tell us, She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Of course, this is most obviously not so, as she is called woman, womb man, because she has the womb to bear the child. This word womb man has become abbreviated in its use to its present form, woman. It would be too much to expect from a body of men who were bent on secrecy and deception that they would give posterity a, f a version free from errors. Truth does not abide with such as are full of guile. <clears throat> In Genesis 3, 
we have an account which is an allegory on the sex tendency or attraction between the sexes, Adam and Eve being but the characters. The first verse reads, Knew the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The verses immediately following also deal with the temptation of the woman by the serpent and the temptation of Adam by the woman. This is followed by their making aprons of fig leaves to hide their nakedness and their expulsion from the garden. Who has not seen this temptation of Eve pictured and illustrated with a tree having a serpent coiled around its trunk in the garden and Eve standing near giving heed to the serpent who is said in the text to have spoken to her? Intelligent people, of course, understand that a belief in the literal statement of this account would be foolish. The story of the Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve were innocent of sex knowledge and were unconscious of their nakedness, has in mind their pre-existence in the spiritual state before sex separation took place, where the dual male-female man existed as two personalities, as it were, in one body, one flesh, in the earthly Eden, to fulfill the purpose of the evolution of the soul, the sexes were born separately and hence became individualized as man and woman. This state of sex consciousness here below is represented by the innocence of childhood before the idea of sex is apprehended. None therefore but those who are grossly credulous or ignorant of the uses of symbology and constructive myth and allegory will believe that the serpent spoke to Eve. The serpent here represents the idea or thought of sex. The serpent is used as the symbol of sex idea because he is considered the most subtle and insidious of all the animals or creatures as he glides about stealthily from place to place, scarcely being observed, always to be guarded against. In like manner, the sex idea is subtle, alluring and insidious and enters the mind imperceptibly and influences thought, often unconsciously, and is always to be guarded against. The minds of the unwary fall an easy prey to the allurements of the subtle serpent of sex, thought, and become, became captives within its coils. The tree, as has been said, symbolizes the organ of sex, and it is to this supposed spiritual transgression against sex purity that the human family is said to have its advent here on this material plane of existence. <clears throat> In this chapter of Genesis 3, it is, relate, is related a dialogue between the Lord and Adam. This is given to amplify the allegory of the creation of our first parents and their expulsion from the garden. It also deals with the nature of the penalty which was imposed upon them for their violation of the sex ordinance. In this chapter, the revisers also give us a statement, after the fact, as to the condition of the earth and its production, said to be due to this violation. This theological supposition involves metaphysical subtleties, which I will not attempt to treat here. I am accepting the spiritual and natural order as it manifestly is and was intended to so to be from the beginning. My self-imposed labour and purpose is other than this. It is straightforward, simple and clear. My own personal discovery and that purpose is to prove to all men the fact that our Bible is an original Irish book translated and altered by the Roman and British doctors the fact that they have used every endeavour to conceal. The recognition of this fact and what it suggests will open up a vast field for inquiry and research and lead to further discoveries of trickery, suppression and fraud. It will at once give a clue to the cause of the centuries-old struggle between the Roman end and the Irish church and the subsequent conquest, sack and ruin of Ireland by the Anglo-Normans and their successors. That the spiritual ideals embodies as they are in the Irish myths in our great book came from the ancient Irish adepts of Irae is beyond doubt. 
They were a highly spiritual order or cult who maintained their order for thousands of years, secluded on this island, immune from enemies. And there they developed those spiritual ideals which they embodied under cloak of myth and allegory in their sacred scriptures. It goes without saying that those ideals were never originally revealed to or discovered by a caste or order of sensual priests or one whose hands were soiled with human blood. Let any intelligent, well-informed person consider the condition of Rome and its priesthood under the empire or during the Dark Ages, and the question is settled at once. The same man be said of the British priesthood and of its leaders for centuries after the conquest of Ireland. The bishop always aspired to power and leadership, or otherwise to be the advisor of or apologist for the king, as when James I at a Puritan conference in Hampton Court flew into a furious rage at mention of the word presbytery, he cried, a Scottish presbytery agreeth as well with a monarchy as God and the devil. Whereupon one of the bishops declared that in this outburst the king spoke like one especially inspired by heaven. Quote taken from the beginnings of New England by John Fisk, page 71. If the king did not see a feasible way in which to put a project through, the bishop was there to show him how. The status of the common people during those ages, by contrast, will enable anyone to form a just estimate of the priesthood of those two sovereignties, always seeking wealth and power. In Genesis 3, 7, it reads, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. It has always been mystified and amused it has always mystified and amused readers of the Bible to know why Adam and Eve had recourse to fig leaves as a means to cover their nakedness. The reason for their doing so will appear very obvious when the myth is explained. The word fig is an Irish etymon and was retained by the revisers in their translation from the original Irish scripture, as they knew that no English-speaking person who might have access to the Bible would apprehend its meaning, and because it aptly expresses the physical aspect of the sexual organs. The word fig means a spilt. The doctors have, in this instance, as they have in some others where it suited their purpose, adhered to the original language and idiom of the Irish expression, more especially in this case, as they knew how misleading the word fig would be to non-Irish folk, and they have perpetrated a facetious pun, insofar as their English readers at least are concerned. The explanation makes it clear also that the translator and compiler of the Breaches Bible in the year 1500 AD knew the meaning of the Irish word fig, for in his version he had it that Adam and Eve made breeches of fig leaves to cover themselves with. Of course, a split is a cleft or breach. This Bible was suppressed through the efforts of the clergy as the translation breeches was too literal and close to the Irish original, and it might be recognised by someone other than the clergy and might suggest the key to the solution of the allegorical illusion in the myth to the human reproductive organs. The ancient Irish celibate priesthood in their myths and sagas often use plain and direct language, without vulgar intent, to show how disgusting and despicable a life or existence the spirit may have in the body, and more especially so to the mind of the spiritually aspiring man. This idea can be found embodied in the myth elsewhere in the Bible, the character in the myth to voice this language is Rab Shaki. The character name consists of two Irish word syllables, and their definition corresponds with the role which he enacts in the myth. The first syllable is from Rame, meaning authority, also calling out, and from Rabak, meaning tolerant, intolerant, bullying, and from Rab Lad meaning boasting, talking foolish. 
The second syllable word shake is from various forms of the word sake, pronounced shak, and its genitives meaning dry, a combat, an attack, an adventurer, bone, service, the peritoneum, a hide, a skin. This character, Rab Shake, from his name qualities, is identified with the lower nature. He represents in the myth the intolerant, combative, and boastful adventurer calling out and uttering foolish talk. In brief, doing in the myth as his name implies, he is doing the bawling out as a servant representing his master, the king of Assyria. This example alluded to above with this character name and his mythical role can be found in 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 27 and following verses where the mythical forces are waging war one side against the other within the body. This warfare is waged to get possession of the body in order to use it either for spiritual progress or central purpose, according to which of the opposing forces wins the victory by swaying the ego or self within in the conflict. The body in this allegorical war is represented by Jerusalem or the holy city. The king of Assyria is the personification of the lower or sensual nature. The men on the wall represent the spiritual forces or individually the spiritual ego within the body. In this verse, Rab Shake, the messenger and spokesman of the central personality, endeavours to taunt and humiliate the forces of the spiritual personality by assuming a boastful attitude, as if to compel them to eat and drink the ordure or the filth of their bodies. <coughs> In 2 Kings chapter XIX, to cite another example of Irish idiomatic expression, the revisers preserved for us is the contumacious epithet applied to the person, person, personified lower nature. It is the name Tir Hakar, king of Ethiopia. Tir Hakar means the, the land of dung, the region of the hips, the seat of the sensual nature. What person who has read Irish history but will remember the epithet which was applied to King James by the Irish when he lost the Battle of the Boyne? They called him Shemo, Shemos Aka, or James the... Question mark. The evidence that the original Bible was an ancient Irish book is not here by chance or accident. It is here because it is the remnant of the original which the revisers retained as best expressing in narrative idioms the episodes occurring in the mythical battle for supremacy which the ancient Irish adepts pictured as taking place between the good and evil qualities within ourselves. And this mythical warfare in the original scriptures was meant to be a constant object lesson and reminder to the initiate and the aspirant for spiritual perfection. Its esoteric meaning has never given to the, was never given to the multitude. In fact, the laity among the ancient Irish never had access to the scriptures. They were for the use of the priesthood and only lessons and inferences taken from them were given orally to the people. Even in England until, this, until a late day, Comparatively speaking, the Bible was kept exclusively for the clergy. John Wycliffe translated a part of the Bible and was persecuted by the clergy, and his life was ever in danger afterwards. In 1378, he was brought, brought to trial. One of the charges brought against him was that he made the Bible more common and more open to laymen and women than it was wont to be to clerks well learned and of good understanding so that the pearl of the gospel is trodden under foot of swine. When Wycliffe died in 1384, a monk denounced him and said that he was the, the idol of heretics, the image of hi hypocrites, the restorer of schisms, the storehouse of lies, the sink of flattery. And all this was because he helped to give the laity an English version of the Bible. The first complete English version of the Bible was published on the basis of Tyndale's translation 
and appeared in England in 1535, one year before Tyndale's death. So it was at a very late date that the English people were given the Bible. Tyndale had, f had to flee from England and after travelling about from place to place on the continent of Europe, he was arrested in Antwerp where after one year of imprisonment he was strangled to death in his cell. It was only in 1538 that in response to the clamour of the people for the Bible, King Henry VIII is issued a command to all ministers to place one bulk of the whole Bible in English set up in some convenient place within the church that ye have cure of, whereat your, par whereat your par parishioners may most commodiously resort to the same and read it. This Bible was changed to a block or other fixture so that no one could carry it away. This clergy opposed every effort of the people to obtain access to the Bible, and it was only after a great struggle that the King James or Revised Version was prepared and given to them. In those days, very few of the common people had any leisure time, and only very few of them could read. But their zeal for the Bible caused many of them to learn to read in order that they might be able to pursue it, peruse it. In time, the Revised Bible became common and was taught literally to the people. And we find that a literal belief in it, in it is encouraged even to this day. In this misconception of the real purport and lack of instruction in the true intent of the scriptures, a great harm has been done, as what is a series of wars between the mythical kings is but the war which is supposedly taking place in the individual aspirant between the, the good and evil forces within himself. This literal conception has caused a sanction and tacit assent by Christian people to wars of bloodshed, cruelty and injustice. Such wars are inwardly condoned or taken as a matter of course by Christian people, as it is shown in the scriptural narrative that the Lord commands his chosen people to wage war on their neighbours. The people were not taught the truth in this matter. The war which he has commanded is the war against evil, the war of the spirit against the lower passions and desires within ourselves. These are the foes against whom we are to wage a constant and unrelenting warfare. Our human enemies we are commanded to love and forgive. The war of the spirit was well understood by Plato, who says in his prayer to Pan and the Phaedrus, O beloved Pan and all the gods who make this spot their dwelling place, teach me to love wisdom as only riches and make me at peace with those within and give me only so much of wealth as a good and holy man can manage and enjoy. It is against the sensual qualities of the lower nature that the Lord gives us command and sanction to war. This is the true intent and meaning of all those mythical wars in the scriptures, such as the Moabite wars, that is, the so-called war between the kingdoms of Moab and Israel. These wars are purely allegorical, as there never existed two such geographical or political divisions designed as Moab and Israel in the entire history of mankind until the priests converted the myth into history. The invention and composition of the history of the so-called war, which is figurative, is based on the idea of the conflict which is going on in the human personality between the good and evil forces, the higher and lower nature in man. This becomes evident when these Irish name, w name words are explained. The term Moab means my father from Mo, my, and Ab, father, and signifies in the myth the lower animal nature, its traits and tendencies, which are at variance with and in opposition to the spiritual nature. The term Israel consists of three Irish word syllables, is from is, the spirit, which is in the human seed fluid, and ra, the name of the sun, and el, the name of God. In the myth, Israel represents the good forces or higher nature in man struggling to overcome the stubborn opposition of the forces of Moab, the lower physical nature, its lusts, appetites and passions. 
This is the true basis of the mythical wars between Moab and Israel. And the teaching of these wars as part of history has been a gross evil and is at variance with the divine junction, love thy neighbor as thyself. In this sense, the scripture has been grossly misinterpreted as it has been in many other ways. It is the same with the fig leaves with which Adam and Eve are said to have converted their nakedness, covered their nakedness. We have been told that the fig was a phallic symbol, but this is the first time that the source from which it originated with its true meaning and sense has been given. It might be said in rebuttal by some that the symbol of the fig was used because it was full of seed. This is not the reason, as there are many other fruits also which abound in a profusion of seed. It therefore becomes obvious that the true reason is as stated from its physical aspect and meaning in the natural sense indicated in the original idiom. And in like manner and according to nature, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? To all intelligent folk, it is needless to, st to say that the coats of skins which the Lord God made for them were the coats of human skins, which now as then constitute the outside covering of every human being who is born into a body of flesh. We see here in this failure to make clear in the text of the character of the coats of skins an illustration of the purpose of the revisers always to mystify and obscure the true meaning. In this way they encouraged by natural inference the belief by the unsophisticated that the coats of skins were of dumb animals. In Genesis chapter 3, 15 it reads, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. This verse deals with physical generation and the enmity between woman and the serpent foreshadows the abandonment of carnal desire or intercourse in the ultimate talistic telis or perfecting work. This the aspirant accomplishes by living a series of successive celibate lives through several incarnations while engaging the perfecting work. We are told that seven such lives are required to accomplish this task. Otherwise, in an esoteric sense, this enmity alludes to the order of nature as well as to the natural and moral instincts for protection of sex and progeny. A writer whose name I can, cannot now recall has stated that in this verse the word heel was not meant and that this word though used was meant for keel. This writer was correct. To be exact, the text should read her heel and not his heel. The word heel was, cryptic, was used cryptically for the buttocks as the heel is the end of the body and the buttocks are also and the seat of the sex principle. It has been rendered thus for camouflage. In this sense, heel or keel means the hips or buttocks, the seat of the generative principle. It is taken from the original version, I believe, where a substitute word has also been used. An example of this use is found in Homer's Iliad, this fact helping to establish that this book is an ancient Irish allegorical poem. The siege of Troy is the siege of Trach, with the settling transferred by the plagiarist to Greece. The name Troy is adapted from the Irish root word trag stand, meaning heaven, hence the phrase heavenly strand. In the Irish idiom it is a name for heaven or the sun. In the south of Ireland there is the town of Ventry. Its ancient name was Ventrach, meaning fair or white strand, and metaphorically it is the city of the sun. We find that the poem bears out this ancient idea. The siege of Troy is the siege or struggle for possession of the body, which is cryptically the holy city, by the higher and lower qualities of our personality. These qualities or aspects are, are personified as characters in the poem, 
and are made to act a part in the drama of the battle between the armies of the opposing forces. This is an idyllic conception of the ancient Irish adepts and was put into cryptic verse by Omer, a poet priest. This is an Irish production translated and transferred to Greece after the conquest of the Irish church by Rome as Ireland was to be obscured forever and all memory of her culture and institutions was to be suppressed and denied to her. The allegorical characters are yet, even in the translation, readily, readily identified by the Irish stem or root word of the names which have been preserved, to which Greek endings have been added. Of such are the names of the demigods, Odysse Odysseus and Ulysses. These are two Irish names disguised under a Greek form. It can be readily seen when the names are explained that they are a part of the ancient Irish culture and ideology. The name Odysseus is composed of two syllables, the first, Od, from Uid, pronounced Yud, meaning the day, an aspect of the sun, and the second, Isis, from the Irish word Esse, meaning the seed, semen, spirit. This name in the Irish form would be Udesi, pronounced Udesea, and embodies it in the idea of the divine spark of the Son of God, whose name he bears, in the seed or spirit in man. The name Ulysses embodies the same idea. The first symbol, Yul, is, disguised, is a disguised form of the Irish word Lul, pronounced Yul, a name of the sun, and the ending of the name is the same as the other. The Irish form of this name is Iulese, pronounced Iulesa. Ulysses, the god man in the seed, is the man of stratagem, that is, art in the poet's fancy. He represents the potential ego or god man in the flesh. The name Aeonis is also an Irish name word from Ion the sun, and Hector is another character name which belongs to the cult of Aire. The name is from Aek, Aek, a horse, the horseman, hence Ector, the charioteer of the sun. The Irish character name has been anglicised as Hector. The Roman and British priests wished to preserve this ancient Irish cryptic lore, and in order to do so, they disguised and transferred it with much more of Irish culture and philosophy to Greece. The disguise, as here explained, will be clearly seen through by any Gaelic scholar to, which, to whose notice these pages may come. The translators of our modern university textbooks of the Odyssey and the Iliad seem not to be aware of the deception practiced on the works of Homer. Many cities have falsely claimed to be the birthplace of Homer. The distinction and honour of being his birthplace belongs to Aire, as the production cryptically embodies the idealistic philosophy and culture of her ancient adepts. The ancient, sun, the ancient name of the poet was Omer, from Om, the Irish name of the sun, hence Omer, the priest of the sun god. This clearly proves his radical identity. British writers have prefixed the letter H to the name. In the Iliad, we find the root, we find the word heel used for the organ of sex. The characters are of course allegorical. Paris wounds Achilles in the heel. The word Paris is formed from the Irish word porous, meaning sex production. Achilles is from the Irish word ach, meaning a skirmish, and ach meaning refusal or denial. Hence, in the mythical theme, we find that Achilles sulks in his tent, refusing to carry on. Right here is absolute proof as to the origin of Homer and the plagiarism of the Iliad and Odyssey and their transference to Greece. From the word ach, we get acha, meaning with them. When the word ach is inflected, it becomes nak, meaning near you, with you beside you. This word is suggestive and for this reason it was employed as a euphemistic name word
for the organ of sex or those addicted to sex pursuits. Such are the Achaeans in the poem. So in harmony with these personified Irish characters, we find that the Irish word porous, expressing the idea of sex production, has been personified and changed to Paris. Paris wounds Achilles in the only spot where he is vulnerable, the heel or organ of generation. These characters and ideas explained clearly prove to us, for the first time in this enlightened modern age, the original source from whence came the classic poems of Homer, the poet priest and devotee of the sun worship of Aire. These poems follow, follow closely the theme contained in our Irish Bible myths of the struggle between the higher and lower qualities and aspects of our nature. In poetry there is taken and always granted a license in the treatment of characters such as gender, male or female. In the case of Achilles, it is the male gender which is designated in order not to expose the real import of the poetic theme. The poet takes license in employing ideas and mythically personifying them as living characters. Paris represents the sun and Helen the moon. The moon is said to be the spouse of the sun. To embellish this theme, but the basis of all its sex desire or attraction and the sensuality of the, no the lower nature. The indictment applies to both sexes. Average humanity is vulnerable in this Achilles heel of the lower nature. This is what the aspirant for spiritual advancement must eliminate from his mind and thoughts in order to make progress in the spiritual work, which leads to emancipation from the Ixion, wheel of death and rebirth in the body. All this digression is to show clearly the use and meaning of the word heal in the Bible text and the source of the original idiom, the ancient Irish priesthood of Aire. Before leaving this third chapter of Genesis, I wish to explain more fully one more character name. It is that of our illustrious Irish mother Eve. This name will take us to the very fountainhead of its inception and formulation to Aire, and it is found in its ancient cultural language of which is an integral and inseparable part. This will be seen from its root word and various derivative forms. The root word has the forms of aod, pronounced a, and air, and i, fire, pronounced a. From this base, we get the following words, a, hell, pronounced a, fell, and a spark of fire, av, av meaning all hail, avhada, avar, meaning a camp, encampment, abode, a net in the form of a sack to catch fish, and ib, eve, meaning a similitude, a tribe. These are but a few of the derivatives and, and are suggestive, conveying an idea of the basis of the name eve. This name word has several other forms and meanings in the Irish, original Irish, which are wonderfully comprehensive and suggestive. Although it has different forms of spelling, under the varied forms there is expressed, either separately or collectively, the shadings of meaning for use in the myth, comprehending the feminine qualities, which are meant to be expressed in this exalted character name befitting the primal Eve, the mother of the human race. It is a beautiful and happy conception, and one worthy of its ancient Irish edict authors. One form of the name is Abhal, pronounced Abhal, from the root word Aya, fire, which it's, in its higher or spiritual sense signifies the fire or spark of the divine spirit, and in its lower or human physical aspect means the fire of gestation. Thence, we have the form Ava, Ave, a woman's name. Another form of the name word is Eve, Eve meaning a country, tribe of people, yea, you. And still another form of the name is Aobhe, pronounced Ava, meaning civility, benignity, neatness, elegance, all feminine qualities, and hence mother of all living. Finally, we have the form Avb, Avb pronounced Eve, 
meaning a courteous civil look or countenance, a patrimonial county, a tribe or race of people. It also means pleasant, civil, courteous, cheerful, neat, elegant. And finally, to com complete the definition of this glorious name of our great Irish mother, Eve, it means sim similitude, likeness, that is, she was made in the image and likeness of God, divine creator. This is a true presentation of the conception of Mother Eve by the ancient Irish adepts of the sun worship of Ieth Sacriost, that the woman and man were created co-equal and by a co-equal father-mother God. By contrast, the revisers have given us an Eve <coughs> which reflects manifestly the mental conception and attitude of churchmen towards women during the Middle Ages, where the question was considered in the Church Council of Marcon in the 16th century as to whether or not woman had a soul. This was decided in the affirmative by a majority of only one vote. Babel's Woman, page 52, by De Leon. During those ages, the status of woman in general was pitiable. It was practically that of a slave or serf. So in the revised version of the Bible, they have given us other than an Irish Eve, one that is, an, a, that is abject, accused and penalised, degraded and impoverished, shorn of her implied queenly qualities as mother of the race, and the attributes with which she was enriched in the original and were hers conceded by prophetic inspiration. For Eve is but a type or figure of all womankind. In her original Irish name, these attributes with which she is endowed are conceded as hers by nature, birthright, and as a divine gift and heritage. This name is an eloquent witness and testimonial of the high accord and esteem in which woman was held in ancient Ireland, to wit, she was spiritual, pleasant, civil, courteous, neat, elegant, a potential goddess, and like man, made in the image and likeness of the Creator. After reading this testimony, as to Irish Gaelic as it is called, being the original language of the Bible, no reader will have any doubt to whom to ascribe its authorship in spite of the deception which has been and is being practiced to conceal this important and new manifest truth.